By now, I think it's obvious to anybody who follows my channel that I have a passion for the profound, for things that are drenched in philosophical and psychological depth. I hope that by identifying the most profound works in every medium, I can provide my viewers with a transformative education. I want to make you wake up tomorrow morning and have you look at the world in a permanently different way, because that is the mark of true education. Sure, that transformation can sometimes be terrifying, but it is something we must do in order to satisfy our evolutionary instincts. Today, I will be looking outside of my normal realm of expertise, going from the medium of gaming into the medium of animation, a field that is often derided as lesser than that of live action, a cartoonish world of bright colors meant to stimulate the brains of children. In response to those who hold that needless prejudice, I shall present a moment that, I believe, eclipses most profound moments that can be found in live action film. That moment can be found in the Japanese anime franchise known as Ghost in the Shell. I challenge any of our supposed cultural betters with a prejudice against animation to watch either the Ghost in the Shell movies or the TV shows and then proclaim that it's just a cartoon. The entire franchise is one long meditation on the nature of human consciousness. What makes human beings special compared to other animate beings? Is there anything that really differentiates us from animals or cyborgs or androids? Allow me to present some meditations on this question, made not only by Ghost in the Shell, but by the philosophers that the franchise references. Before I begin, I wish to address those of you who have watched my original video on the first Ghost in the Shell movie. If you wish, you can skip to this point in the video. That way, you don't have to wait longer to find out what I believe is the most profound moment in the history of animation. However, if you have not seen that original video, I strongly recommend you pay attention for the next few minutes. I am sure that at some point during your secondary or post-secondary education, you have learnt of the phrase, I think, therefore I am, arguably the most famous of philosophical maxims. The original author of this phrase, René Descartes, was aware of the limitations of human perception. How could we be certain that the world we see before us isn't some illusion brought on by a malevolent force? be it a demon or something like the Matrix. We never can be. In the search of an irrefutable reality, Descartes crafted his maxim. If all else is an illusion, at least Descartes could be certain that he existed. Because he could think. For hundreds of years, and even arguably to this day, this maxim is held to be self-evident, to be the base of all philosophy. What a lot of people don't know is that there were philosophers providing challenges to Descartes' maxim, most notably the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. In Nietzsche's book, Beyond Good and Evil, he challenges Descartes' notion of I in I think therefore I am. Unlike Descartes, Nietzsche is not so certain that the I, or in other words, the ego, exists. If we have the capacity to think, who or what gave that capacity to us? How do we know that capacity is truly ours and that the thoughts we create are truly our own? If you're having a hard time understanding this, think of it this way. When you get the idea to take revenge on somebody who wronged you, did you have that idea? Or did that idea have you? In other words, you did not create the idea for revenge. Rather, the idea came to you. It is for reasons like these that Nietzsche criticized Descartes' notion of I and thus fostered doubt in this supposedly infallible maxim. To make the maxim more accurate, Nietzsche figured we should remove the notion of I from I think therefore I am, and instead assume that something is thinking. Now I bring all of this up because we see this philosophical dilemma acted out in the first Ghost in the Shell movie. The main character, Motoko Kusanagi, is a cyborg suffering an identity crisis. Every part of her, with the exception of her brain, is artificial. The original owner of the brain, at least in regards to the first film, is unknown. 
with the lack of a personality, with the lack of memories to define her individuality, we see Matoko struggle to find her true identity. Who was she before she became a cyborg? Did she even exist at all? Does she exist now? When the character of Bato witnesses Matoko's struggle with her notion of self, he tangentially invokes Descartes' maxim. Isn't it enough that she has the ability to think? Therefore, she is? Though Bato never receives a direct response, the creators of the film imply the response throughout the story. The most notable example is with the scene on the boat. While Bato and Matoko are philosophizing with each other, they both hear a voice speak up inside their cyber brains. The voice sounds like Matoko's. When Bato asks whether or not Matoko was the one that spoke, she remains silent. The film cuts to the next scene before we can get a definitive answer. What this scene is trying to convey relates back to Nietzsche's criticism of Descartes. Is it I who thinks? Or is something else thinking? Was it Matoko that spoke? Or did something else speak? Did she think up the phrase, or did something else? The notion of I, or the ego, is challenged in other parts of the film, notably with the garbage man. His memories were implanted into his augmented brain. His notion of self, therefore, is completely false. The terror this man feels upon realizing this fact is mirrored in the audience, and no wonder. If the human brain can be quantified, if its mechanisms can eventually be replicated or manipulated, maybe our notion of self can be replicated, manipulated, or worse, obliterated. Worst of all, if our egos can be obliterated by technology, what does that say about the human notion of a soul? Maybe there is no soul let alone one that makes human beings special. Maybe there is no ghost in the shell. This was the terrifying element that I referenced towards the beginning of this video. When our preconceptions are challenged, it leaves us in a state of existential limbo, brooding, spinning, resentful, and unsure of where to go. Billions of people around the world live and die by a belief in the soul, in an ego that transcends the body after death. If that's not true, if we're not actually special and our egos are illusions that can be manipulated by technology, then there might be no purpose or meaning to our consciousness and all the suffering it brings. Luckily, Ghost in the Shell offers two potential solutions to this existential dilemma. One solution that we see at the end of the first film is a merging of body and mind with machines. Doing this will elevate our consciousness to such enormous heights that we can become godlike. This is why when Matoko's consciousness merges with that of the puppet master at the end of the first film, she sees an angel descend from above. Her mind is rising to a level of greatness that can only be described as heavenly, and represented using an imperfect human concept like an angel. It's a beautifully poetic notion to evolve beyond our primordial pasts and become immortal. It addresses the pain of existential angst. To illustrate such an event, and also make it somewhat believable, it might cause some to declare Motoko's transcendence as a profound moment. Maybe even THE most profound moment, at least in the history of animated film. It's hard to argue against such a declaration, given the fact that Ghost in the Shell is the most celebrated film in the realm of Japanese animation with the possible exception of Akira. However, I will boldly challenge this declaration. While this moment is undeniably profound, I think there is one that is slightly more profound. It deals with a potential second solution to this problem of existential angst, where instead of becoming like a god, one goes in the exact opposite direction. This moment can be found in the film's sequel, Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence. The story of Ghost in the Shell 2 takes place three years after the events of the first film. Motoko Kusanagi has long since disappeared into the net after having merged with the Puppet Master. This time around, the story centers on the aforementioned Bato and his partner Togusa, 
They are investigating a series of possible murders carried out by sex dolls against their owners. The theory is that somebody is implanting replicated consciousness into these sex dolls and programming that consciousness to kill. During their investigation into who this programmer might be, Bato and Togusa arrive at a mansion owned by somebody named Kim an ex-soldier turned hacker who potentially has ties to the manufacturer of the sex dolls. After searching the mansion, they come across a human-sized, digitally augmented marionette laying lifeless in a chair. Convinced that this marionette isn't so lifeless, Bato turns the chair over and addresses the marionette as Kim. Kim then begins to speak. When Bato and Togusa ask Kim why he chooses to live in a motionless marionette, he responds by condemning humanity's inherent imperfection. Man's knowledge, man's perception of reality, both are corrupted for various reasons, be it bias or plain irrationality. How often do we witness our fellow man ignoring or willfully obscuring reality in order to protect their emotions? Kim figures that the only way a human can transcend these imperfections is to either become a god via augmentation of the human body, or to go in the opposite direction. To Kim, that opposite direction involves becoming a doll. By separating the mind from the body, the mind's perception of reality won't be corrupted by the body's imperfection. Kim's mind, like Matoko's mind, exists in the virtual world in the net, only returning to the body when necessary. When the mind is absent from the body, that body becomes more or less that of a doll. This notion of separating the body from the mind in order to achieve true enlightenment is typical of Eastern religion, specifically Buddhism. The aim of the Buddhist is to reject the illusion of the material world in order to achieve nirvana. For the sake of this discussion, nirvana can also be understood as true reality. The creators of Ghost in the Shell 2's story take this ancient religious concept and couch it in a secular, scientific scenario. One that could very well happen if and when consciousness becomes digitized. In other words, the Buddhist concept of nirvana could theoretically become real, at least in a digital sense. We would leave the imperfect reality as perceived through our mortal bodies and we would do that by separating our mind from our body. And to drive Kim's point home, he demonstrates just how easily our perception of reality is corrupted, not just to Bato and Togusa, but to the audience. At this point in the film, the scene of Bato and Togusa entering the mansion and confronting Kim begins to loop. The same thing happens three times with only minor details changing. At first, the two protagonists, as well as the audience, get the sense that something is off, but they don't quite know what it is. Things become especially odd when the marionette turns into a marionette of Togusa, and the supposedly real Togusa has his insides revealed to be cybernetic. For the few minutes that this happens, the characters and the audience get a hint that what they are perceiving isn't real, but in those few minutes, they are unable to determine what, if anything, is real. Though it is eventually revealed that Kim was hacking into the minds of Bato and Togusa and was causing this loop in reality to happen, we are left with an important question. At what point did reality stop and Kim's hacking begin? If we were in Bato or Togusa's shoes, would we be able to know? Most likely, we would forever lose our grip on reality and become the dolls, the playthings, of somebody or something like Kim. Thankfully for us, the audience, we were only at the mercy of the film's director, Mamoru Oshii, for a few minutes. But even then, the impact of this scene is permanent for those who truly understand it. If human beings, to quote Kim, can be quantified and reduced to simple mechanisms and materials, what makes us so different from dolls? What prevents us from being played with by forces greater than ourselves? To an extent, we already are the playthings of our emotions, as I stated before when talking about revenge. Who's to say that one day, when brains can become digitally augmented, that we couldn't become full automatons? That our perceptions of reality could be permanently corrupted? 
that we could forever lose our sense of self and become nothing less than a doll. If we assume that human beings are quantifiable, then theoretically, human beings are dolls to a certain extent, and can have their sense of self obliterated. The fact that Ghost in the Shell 2 made not only a convincing case in this regard, but also demonstrated how easily our perception of reality can be toyed with, truly makes this the most profound moment in the history of animation. While I believe the first Ghost in the Shell film on the whole is better and more important to the medium, I don't believe any moment from that film measures up to the level of deep philosophical insight presented by Bato and Togus' interaction with Kim. This could easily become our future, and thankfully we have this film to prepare us. We can decide whether or not to augment our brains. We can possibly install software to prevent this sort of hacking from happening. Having said that though, we are all going to have to make that step towards the next stage of human evolution sooner or later. The only thing we need to decide, however, is which route to take. Do we become like gods, where we perfectly augment our bodies and minds with technology? Or do we become like dolls, where we separate our mind from our body and forever become one with the digital matrix? Let me know what you would choose in the comments section below. If you liked this video, please hit that like button. When you do that, it tells the YouTube algorithm that not only this video, but all the other videos on my channel are worth watching. It will then share my videos around in people's recommended feeds. Also, if you want to help me create more content like this, where I break down complicated, profound ideas into a digestible format, please consider supporting me on Patreon. There are a lot of rewards available for you to choose from. I will put a link to my Patreon in the description box below. Until next time, just remember, as per usual, stay yellow.